Well, this morning, we're going to continue in our series on spiritual formation. You might recall that we are working our way through six weeks of different types of Christendom, different ways that we can, in our own lives, connect, in our own lives, share the love of God. Evangelism, in many ways, should be, I think, the easiest one of these topics to talk about. Yet, it's difficult. It makes us all a little bit uncomfortable. It makes us all a little bit queasy. So I thought what we'd do this morning is we'd start by looking at that verse back that uh, was read earlier from Luke. Luke 9, and we're going to really focus on verse 1 and 2. And as we read this, we're going to read it out loud. Imagine when he talks, when Jesus talks about the disciples, put your own name in there. Put your own name in there. Because isn't that really what we're getting called to? As Jesus offers power and authority to the disciples, Jesus is really offering us power and authority authority, and responsibility too. So let's read this together this morning. <coughs> then Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. To proclaim the kingdom of God. If I said to you, Today we're going to talk about and then we're going to go out and do some evangelism. What's the first thing you think about? Probably some kind of an introduction where we want to make a, uh, an instant decision. If you die today, do you know where your soul is going to go? And let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. And is there any reason why you wouldn't make that safe decision today? Isn't that really what we think about it? Suppose, let's play the what if game for just a minute. What if I told you this morning that I went to the state fair folks and on Saturday, the biggest day of the state fair, I got for us the corner, the perfect corner, the one that everybody stops at. And what we're going to do is I'm going to pass this clipboard out. And I want everybody to sign up for a half hour time that you can go evangelize there, that million people that day. How's that sound? I got caught up here saying that didn't happen. <laughs> so many people cringing about that. And that's natural. That's what we do. We see evangelism, and in our society, we're kind of uncomfortable with that because that's your thing and I've got my thing. But clearly here, God is given us the power and the authority to proclaim the world. I think that we, what I'm going to suggest this morning is that we're looking at an incomplete picture and an incomplete definition of evangelism. We tend to think of it as this saving salvation message, and it is. But just like the old Paul Harvey, the rest of the story, that's only half of our message. And I think a lot of times, we don't even start with the right message. So how about if we take a look at a definition that maybe we can all agree on, a definition of evangelism. Evangelism might be defined as the spreading of the Christian gospel, the good news, by personal witness or public proclamation. Now, public proclamation is what we were just talking about, right? Going out on the street corner, maybe picking a block. This section here, you take the back block, go door to door, knock on the doors, and tell everybody about Jesus Christ. But see, I think there's both parts to this. The personal witness 
and the public proclamation. And there are a couple of different ways that we can personally witness. And you might think about that as a testimony. You might talk about it as your faith story. Any of those kinds of ways that we talk about this are all pretty common to this. But it could be any one of these. And why is that so difficult anyway? Why is it so difficult? Can't we just about in our minds think of the turn of the century, people standing on the corner asking for people to be saved? You think back to the Billy Graham crusades. Why is this so difficult today? We're going to watch a video now, and this video is a, a short video from N.T. Wright, who's a British Bible theologian, uh, extremely, extremely knowledgeable, but I think he does a great job of boiling some of this stuff down for us. Do you want to go ahead and play that? Have some cultural appeal. Um, but this, this same sense of cross-cultural angst or, or puzzlement occurred to me 10 or so years ago on one particular occasion, which struck me at the time as a parable of what it's like, what it was like for St. Paul preaching the gospel in a plural society, and what it's like for us preaching the gospel in a plural society, which is uh, what I'm more or less talking about this morning. I was in Atlanta, Georgia, for a conference of the Society of Biblical Literature, and it was November, and while I was in Atlanta, a much more important event was taking place in Australia, namely that England were playing Australia in the final of the Rugby World Cup. This is something that doesn't happen every year, it's every four years or so, and England had never won it before, and Australia were hosting the tournament, and England had somehow made it through to the final against the host nation. This is big, and if any of you know Australia, um, Australia needs to beat England. It's kind of, you know, the child needs to dig the parent in the ribs, as it were. Um, of course, you in America wouldn't know about that. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, I, I, I looked on television channels in my hotel room, no sign of it. And anyway, my wife was with me, was still sound asleep and didn't want to have the television on. But clearly, nobody in America was interested in this. So I snuck down to the lobby at about, I don't know, 5.30 in the morning, nobody about, and I phoned from a public phone my daughter, who I knew would be watching. And she was just ecstatic because up to the last minute, the scores had been leveled, 17 points each, and in the very last minute, the poster boy of English rugby, Johnny Wilkinson, had dropped a goal, and England won the game by 20 points to 17. And England were absolutely over the moon. My daughter was ecstatic, I was ecstatic. And here I was with this wonderful news earth-shattering news, and I was in a hotel lobby in Atlanta with some sleepy hall porters and one or two people setting off for a morning job, and I wanted to go up and hug the clerk behind the desk and say, did you hear the news? England just beat Austria, and I realized they're probably not going to be, not just not interested, they don't even know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I might as well walk out on the main street in St. Andrews and say that uh, China has just beaten West Germany at table tennis. You know, it's not what everyone is talking about. And I had some good news, which was just nonsense in Atlanta. And then as I paced around and had a, co a coffee and waited for conference participants to show up, for somebody who knew what this was about, the first person I met who knew was an Australian. <laughs> and I had some wonderful news which was folly to Americans, scandalous to Australians, but for us who believed. <laughs> uh, and a whole generation of little English boys want to be Johnny Wilkinson now, as a result of that moment, go figure. That's how good news worked, and it's how good news works. You cannot assume that the people you meet are asking the same question that you're, that you're wanting to give the correct answer to. We did assume that in our culture for many years. We assumed that people were walking around, wondering how to go to heaven, feeling guilty because they thought, I've done quite a few bad things in my time, uh, if I'm really honest, and maybe that's going to be problematic when the great day comes, whatever. And we have the good news that actually all you have to do is believe and that will be all right. And that's how we've lived for many generations in the Western churches. And now we are in a world where people aren't 
going around asking that question. And actually, this means we're back in the main street. This is how it was in the first century, second, third, fourth. Even, actually, under Constantinian Christianity, they were still asking all kinds of questions which didn't intersect, in fact, with the true heartland biblical gospel. They, uh, early Christianity was born into a culture which wasn't talking about this, which didn't want it, which didn't need it, and yet which Paul and the others went out and said, It is more difficult today. It's more difficult today because, as N.T. Wright said, there are a group of people out there right now that really see Christianity and the need for it. There aren't a bunch of people out there right now that are looking at the lives of Christians and saying, I want that. Maybe this will help. I, I want to suggest this morning that there's two parts to evangelism. Okay? The first part is introducing the unsaved to Jesus the Christ. And the second part is living out God's kingdom on earth. The first part is what we call an eschatological premise. This premise is the, the idea that salvation is for eternity as we go to greet our Savior when we get called home. Not yet. That's the not yet. But see, that's how we've reduced God in our culture. That we can focus on the not yet because that's really not very inconvenient. I can have God and then I can actually deal with God later when I have eternity. But there's a second part to that. And that's the kingdom of God here on earth. And that's the right now. That's the way that we live our lives. That's the way that we proclaim the good news. That's the way that we tell our stories. Our faith stories. You know, for centuries, all of our literature was passed down verbally around the campfire at night, sharing a story over and over and over for generations. I, I'm tempted to say we've lost that, but I don't think it's gone yet. Here's a couple examples. Not long ago, the movie Unbroken came out. A movie about Louis Zamperini, <coughs> who had been an Olympian, gone into the service in World War II, spent 47 days on a lifeboat floating in the ocean, only to be captured and imprisoned in the Japanese prison camp where he was forced to endure unspeakable torture. If you read his book and you talk about it, yes, he did survive that. But what gets lost a little bit in the, in the movie is that when he came home, much like our veterans today, his life had been transformed and he suffered what today we would call post-traumatic stress. He started coping with it by drinking and doing all kinds of things that were destructive in his life. And at one point his wife was ready to leave. And she convinced him at the last moment to go back to her. She had been at Billy Graham Crusade and she convinced him to go back the next day with her. And he did. And through the power of that shared story of hearing the good news, he was able to get rid of all of the habits that were self-destructive for him. That's the, that's the salvation and the saved and the introduction to Jesus Christ. But it's the story that's getting told 60 years later. The hearing, the power of the transformation is changing the lives of people today. If you go to the website CRU 
dot org crew, C-R-U, that, this is, a, used to be Campus Crusades. And you'll see on there, these are three stories here, and if you scroll down, there's another 20 of them. All young people talking about how God has transformed their life. Um, it wasn't, gosh, two or three weeks ago, we were back in our Sunday CLT time, and one of the group back there said, just, we were in something else, and they brought up evangelism. And they said, you know, I really don't do very well at that, and I've got to do better at that. And we launched into this long discussion about evangelism. Wednesday night, we talked about it in our Wednesday night group, in our Wednesday night service. And you know, when you begin to talk about it, you begin to hear some incredible stories. You hear stories about a man that was driving down the road, falling asleep, and mysterious hands on his shoulders shaking him that led him to a hospital where he found out that he was having a heart attack. You hear stories about an unwed couple who got married, lost the child, but then found a solid, lasting marriage in Jesus Christ and the support, love, and comfort he brought. Uh, let me give you an example, which is obviously we're going to talk today about starting to be able to talk about our faith story. For me, I don't know what it would be, maybe half a dozen times a year, when you're in one of those places where you feel the Holy Spirit come upon you, I'll get it. just like shivers up and down my whole entire body. I just shake and shiver. It wasn't, um, I guess it was probably a month ago, I had been trying to make a big decision, thought I made it, and I was going to write this letter that outlined this decision I was making. And in my mind, I was trying to formulate the structure of this letter, so I hopped on the treadmill, and I'm the only one down in the basement. I have no music on, it's just me. And I'm formulating this idea of this letter and this decision that I was going to make. And just as we're sitting here this morning, and I heard the choir sing, I heard a voice that said, yeah, but that's not where you need See, we all have these stories. But for whatever reason, we hold them back and we don't tell each other. I'm going to give you one more. Um, this one was this fall. Many of you know that um, I have twin daughters. They're both seniors at Luther College up in Detroit. And one of my daughters um, wanted, I'll say she wanted to be athletic. She tried really hard. And when she was a freshman in college, she got on their cross-country team. Three meets into the season, she developed what they call compartment syndrome in her legs and had that surgery. She lost her season, and then her sophomore season, and then her junior season, trying to rehab. So her senior season comes, boy, did she work hard. And she got on the cross-country team. She runs three meets, and then in the, on a Tuesday night, she calls home and tells Kathy, you know, my stomach just feels funny. And Kathy had had her appendix out, and she said, hey, if you have an appendix stack, I think you should go to student health tomorrow morning. So Allie went to student health at 10 o'clock on Wednesday. At 12 o'clock, she went to the emergency room. At 2 o'clock, they called me and... Uh, a specialist sits here, and she had a large cyst in her stomach. And they didn't know 
It was so large what they were dealing with. Now this is a five foot three, 113 pound girl. And of course, at 21 years old, and I was in Kansas City that day, and you hear this and you hear about, it's just natural, first thing you think about is cancer. So I spent the next two weeks freaking out and praying, and freaking out and praying, and freaking out and praying. Now this daughter has been one that said, yeah, I'll come to church when I want to come to church, but don't be pushing that on me. And I've always been a little bit concerned about her faith. Through this whole thing, her faith was rock solid. While I was freaking and praying, she's like, Dad, it's going to be fine. But the day of the surgery, went in for surgery, and you know it's going to be a long day for surgery when the physicians before the surgery are bringing forms for you to sign where they can bring guests and they can film it. It's going to be a long day when that happens. So they do surgery on her, 5'3", 113 pounds, and if you can imagine, 9-inch ball, filled with almost two liters of fluid, came out of her stomach. Not a lit any sign anywhere of cancer. She healed. She's healthy. And all the while, her faith was rock solid. So when you say, we talk about our faith story, where do you see God at work in your life, the lives of those around you, you would think that'd be that's a pretty good story, right? Her faith and healing and all of that. By the time we were done, she hadn't run for two months. And for a small college, they're a really good cross-country program. And that conference is a really good cross-country program. The doctor released her from his care on Wednesday. And, it, and their last meet was the next Friday, two days later. She hadn't run in two months. But the doctor said, if you want to run, you can. You're healthy. She knew that if she ran, chances are she'd finish last. So she went back and forth. Do I run? Do I not run? I don't want to be embarrassed, but on the other hand, it's my last track meet ever. And it just so happened that last track meet was a big one, and it was a home meet in Cora. She decided to run. We went up there on a Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock, and it was so cold. I almost stayed home. Because you know I don't like cold weather. She ran, and she didn't finish Kind of last, she finished way last. Like, everybody's watching their watches. But here's what happened. Somewhere in this week, the student newspaper got a hold of Valley's story. There was a home meet. So all along the way, there were groups of people cheering her on. And at the finish line, there were 200 people cheering her on. What's your faith story? Can you articulate it? Mark chapter 8, verse 29. Jesus says to Peter, Who do you say I am? Now, there's a good chance that Jesus knew what Peter thought. But he made him say it. I need to hear it. Because with that responsibility, with that oral proclamation, when the story is verbalized, it becomes more real. Just like everything else in our life. Who have you shared it with today? You know, as we've been in these different groups and different things going on, I'm amazed that family members don't even share their story with each other. <coughs> friends, friends that have been together for years, church families, don't know each other's stories. 
How about this week? We sit down intentionally and we think about what our individual faith story is and then we verbalize that to someone in our family or a close friend. Can you imagine the power that we would have if we could once again start that tradition of telling stories. After all, it's easy because the story is really the good news. And if you love someone, don't you want them to have that good news? <clears throat> Will you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, Creator God, <coughs> Divine Lover of our souls. For us, sometimes we want to talk about ourselves. We want to talk about our lives. We want to focus strictly on us. <coughs> Give us strength this week, Lord, that as we go out into this world, we can go out with confidence, sharing our story, which is really your story. Guide us, strengthen us, support us with our lack of courage. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's